Yes, so this morning, these are the issues that we are canvassing for you. Two major issues. Number one, your most wasteful and loss-making state-owned enterprises. You know why they are wasteful and all they have been good at is making losses? <clears throat> Simply because they are manned by square pegs in round holes. Because there's no sense, there's no reason why other private individuals are doing the jobs they are doing and they are successful at them. And yet, they keep failing. And the enterprises that our forebears, those who founded this country, began to build them for us, all of them, we're selling them. What's that do we tell ourselves? We are telling ourselves how incompetent we are at managing anything and managing it well, if it is for the state, if it's not for our private you know, uh, use. Well, so they've been making losses. You've heard me speak about this before. In fact, they've been breaching every law on how they are supposed to render accounts each year. And the finance minister has been at pains to complain. I don't know why he does only complaining, because he can do more than that. And the losses they've been making is in the billions of Ghana CDs. And guess what? You and I know that they are, they are CEOs. They earn fat salaries. They earn more than the president. And the finance minister has suggested earlier that they will take steps to sort of rationalize these salaries so that they earn quite a bit. Unfortunately, this is where we are. They've been making losses in the billions. So there is a hint that particularly those that have been making the losses all the time. There are just a few of them that appear profitable. Those ones may have to be privatized. We have to sell them. We have to take our hands off them and give it to private hands because private people are better able at managing. Can you imagine the irony? Well, so we'll be discussing that. Why are we where we are and why should we always be privatizing what government, you know, could do and do a lot better at. Our, our own GMPC, which makes all the good money and has more than enough to give out on social, corporate social responsibility, dole out so much for chiefs and other people and organizations, including that of the first lady or so we had, to be able in, in dollars, in, in a lot, to do their work is also in a bit of trouble. How do they explain all of that? Our uh, first topic for the meantime is James Jachi Kwesin. He has been injuncted by the Supreme Court. He's been stopped from holding himself as MP for Assay North, or for any other place for that matter. And he is unable to go to Parliament to work as an MP until the suit before the Supreme Court is completely dealt with. There are some who are raising hell about that. The question we're asking this morning is, why should we listen to the concerns and the claims about travesty of justice? Now, when the ruling was given, the Attorney General spoke, the Baba Jamal, who also Baba Jamal spoke for the uh, MP's legal team, and we also heard from Professor Kweku Asari, Stephen Kweku Asari, who has some very interesting uh, views as to how he should go about it. Uh, many lawyers say he's proffering very strange, you know, uh, advice. Let's listen to them. There ought to be an equal application of the law. Uh, the same fate befell um, Adamu Domani Sakandi. He was all qualified at the time that nominations were opened, and we don't know what happened to him. He was subsequently declared ineligible, and, and for that matter, his seat was taken away. So there ought to be even application of the law. If it happened to Adamu Domani Sakandi of the MP MPP, yes, it, it also has to happen to a gentleman of the NDC who has also fallen foul of the same law. 
it means that yes, as we have as the high court that had early on held the seat for me, <laughs> the people of Asin, Asin North will not be represented. And I think that we know for all these legal gymnastics that have been employed by the lawyers for Asin North, perhaps the violations should have been, should have been conducted long ago. And I, in my view, think that there's even nothing in the way of the Electoral Commission to declare the, the seat vacant. The High Court has ruled, uh, given a judgment, uh, determining the status of the gentleman as, as not qualified to have stood for election and had actually cancelled the election conducted at the or in the Arsenal constituency. And the Court of Appeal subsequently struck out this appeal for non-compliance with the, with the rules of the Court of Appeal. So there's no appeal pending. And I think the way is clear. But of course, the Supreme Court has ordered an expedited hearing and determination of this matter. Yes, I believe that the Supreme Court hearing definitely will also affirm all the principles of law that I have indicated had early on been established by the, by the courts of Ghana. The Supreme Court has given its ruling, but we vehemently disagree with their position. I think that it is a sad day for all of us that if what it means is that a sin of is also not going to have representation in Parliament for as long as this case lasts. Last. That is a sad situation because there are pre precedents in this country. We all remember the uh, case in uh, uh, Iowa, so uh, uh, West Wagon, where the lady was allowed to stay in, court, uh, in Parliament. There are so many hanging issues. This, um, whatever it is, injunction came from nowhere. I'm afraid the Supreme Court is rushing too much into too many political cases. And I'm afraid when it does so, it's setting aside too many precedents. And I'm really worried that the Supreme Court is going to create a situation when people are not going to take it very seriously. I'm worried. I wrote about this uh, many months ago when Samson invited me to give a New Year statement. I said the most difficult situation facing the country now is a court that is increasingly being perceived as partisan in a country where we are excessively partisan. Right. Joining me in the studio for this discussion, Kweku Pinso. He is lawyer and managing solicitor Pinso, Pinso and Co. Uh, thank you very much, Sinia, for making the time to join us. Thank you. Great. Um, Randolph Chumesiankra, he's also a lawyer. Uh, Professor E. Kofia Bochi, Dean, UPSA Law School, will also join us um, shortly. Um, so thank you very much. Keep your dials here. This is where you get the very best. I can assure you that. Now, um, I start started in introducing you by saying senior <laughs> it's a fact so um if we can start on this very brief note yeah the chief justice issued a circular uh was a letter supposed to be to judges yeah asking them to comply strictly with the old age tradition of calling the cases of seniors first in court. That statement is out there in the public. And as you know, um, he's come under very heavy criticism. What do you say about that? What is that thing about this thing about calling cases of seniors before uh, juniors get called in court? Some say it is not in the interest of the, of the clients. The court is there for the client. It's not there for the lawyers to show their seniority. Uh, I think uh, this statement the Chief Justice has put out there reinforces what has always been there. We say a tradition. Tradition is like a convention. It's not a rule of law. It's a rule of practice. And what it means is that the judges who sit over these cases, they use their discretion to call cases but it's not a strict application of any practice or any rule of law. 
So in the first place, I'll say that whatever the Chief Justice said, I wholly and wholeheartedly support him. It is the good for the profession that certain traditions that we came to meet, we don't only stick to it because they are traditions, but we stick to it for the good of the profession itself. I like always to put these things in proper context. There are a lot of traditions that we have at a bar. Mm. You go to a court, you bow to a judge. It's a tradition. It never, it is never going to come that people are going to greet a justice like you are greeting a soldier in the street. We go to court and there are traditions. One of the traditions is the fact that the Attorney General has got preeminence over everybody in the courtroom. Anybody come from the AG's office, he could be the junior most person in there. It's a tradition. It's, it's a form of respect that we give to an office. It doesn't mean that when Attorney General comes to court, his law is better than anybody in there. And so forth and so on. And it is, from our perspective, all of these things are absolutely necessary to ensure that a day does not come that everything breaks down and then we have something on our hands that we cannot give a name to. It is true that, as someone has said, uh, it makes a junior appears maybe uh, an, uh, not an, a lawyer, but like uh, inferior to a senior. It is not true. Even when we came into the practice, I'm not talking this way because I'm now a senior. Mm. But when we came into a practice, this is the trial we came to meet. But the judges always have a discretion. <laughs> it's not even true that cases are strictly called in the order of seniority because a judge combines this with his own case management. So if we're senior, a judge can single you out and tell you that, okay, can we have the case of this person called? But it is, the judge is not bound as a matter of law. The tradition does not bind the judge to do it in a particular way, but it's an observation. But the instruction of the CJ now makes it binding on the judges. I wouldn't call it so. It's not, I mean, it's like a tradition that we are forgetting. Mm. It's like things are getting mixed up. It's like people are now forgetting that things that we need to be doing. So the judges are to observe that practice, but it doesn't mean that the judge is going to make a roll call, like first senior, second senior, third senior. It has never been that way. But it appears to me that we're getting to a situation... There are a few judges who do that. There are a few judges who... Mm -hmm. Very few of them who in their courts will want to find out if you rise up, <laughs> they will check <laughs> when you were called to the bar oh, no. and then ask whether uh, there are any other in the, in the courtroom who were called earlier than you were and why you are calling your case before them and even if you had their permission to do so. Well, if I find a judge who does that, I won't call the judge names. He's sticking to tradition in the strictest sense of it. But I personally do not find anything essentially or inherently wrong with a judge who wishes to ensure that seniors get heard before mm. a junior. And that's my view of the matter, and I hold very strictly to it. Mm. Because at the end of the day, it does not affect justice, substantive justice, in any sense of the word. The Bar Association issued a statement in support of the Chief Justice's statement, and they say that the Chief Justice is absolutely right. It's an old age tradition. It has to be kept. Things are getting out of hand. People, uh, some young lawyers are not learning tradition, um, and they are doing things, getting out of the way. Uh, the purpose is for, so far, is a single reason that has been raised. The purpose is so that the juniors will learn from their seniors. So if your senior's case is called, you have the opportunity to listen to them advocate, and then you take some lessons out of that. Some say that's not right. Um, a junior is not coming to the courtroom to learn from some senior from another place. And that, that also gives an impression that if I'm coming to court, I am better off looking for a senior lawyer. Well, you see, it, it, it's a perception, or even what you've said, I mean, it's a, and we do respect, it's a one-sided view of the matter. The issue of learning has got nothing to do with the fact that the senior is always right. But sometimes you sit in a court, lots of things happen. Even seniors get bashed, seniors, and all, it's all part of a learning process. So the idea is not just because a senior necessarily knows more law than a junior. That's not it at all. 
Because even these traditions... The Justice thing, Oliver Wendell Holmes yes. said that the life of the law is not logic, yes. but experience. It is. So it is expected that a senior will know better. Oh, it's not so at the bar. It's not so. Indeed, and in fact, even at the bar, we don't call senior senior at the bar. It's your learned friend. It's wrong to call a senior my learned senior. I always insist that I'm not a learned senior. I'm your learned friend. And indeed, if we're going to go by that, then it means that seniors will always win cases over juniors. I won several cases when I was junior over seniors, and so forth and so on. Indeed, it's only when I became a senior that I felt very, 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 uh, I'm trying to get a word. In other words, I, I felt very uncomfortable because they have just come fresh. They know more law. They know recent cases. They just passed law school, recent authorities and wherever. Mm. When you become a senior, you even become more vulnerable. I mean, I'll be very honest with you at the bar. And that is my own experience. Do you, do you insist that this, this tradition ought to be maintained or that it ought to be tweaked somehow? Well, as long as judges have discretion over the matter, it has always been the case that judges have discretion over the matter. But to be very honest with you, it's very annoying when you are in court. Sometimes Junior even comes in. I mean, he, he wants his case to be called. It's very annoying. Mm. So that if anything at all, the situation has not arisen where the juniors themselves have no regard whatsoever for anything that goes on in the court. So that he comes in and he still believes that even though he has come to meet as a senior, for some reason he must have his case called. So now it's like topsy turvy, as we call it. I don't know whether that's the right expression. Mm. So I mean, it's like the sea is rough and the fishes don't give. Everybody thinks he can do anything. And I think it's about time that some. Something mm. is, is, is planted in the court for people to observe a form, some decorum, some protocol. And these protocols, for me, will never, ever vanish. And mm. it is about time that we became aware. Calling judges my lord, calling judges your oh, worship, uh -huh. your honor, yes. will not change. It, it doesn't have to change. You can't go to court and be, I mean, what do you tell a judge? Mm. You know, like you're working, you have an employer, somebody brought you in a job. You are not obliged when you meet him to greet him. But it's respectful for you to greet him. It's respectful. I mean, there are things that we haven't got in our country, what we call traditions. Mm. I mean, customary traditions or whatever. Mm. A time will never come in this country where you can go to a choose palace and greet you with your left hand. It's never going to happen. All right. And, and for me, let me put it this way, let me put it this way. For me... In this life that we all live, we all have a duty in our time to ensure things that, in our view, we ought to do right. I'm very comfortable that in my lifetime, up to where I find myself, things are being done the way that they ought to be. Mm. If a generation comes, and now in the UK, a primary school teacher calls his teacher James. I may be very uncomfortable when my juniors call me Kweku. I feel very uncomfortable. Maybe it's my training. A time will come that these things that we are talking about will not matter. Mm. Please, let me okay. die and let me go. Let the next generation come and then okay. begin to do that. Uh, very finally, briefly to you. Um, you're, you're a pastor or you're a lay preacher? I'm a pastor. You're a pastor. Um, and in Easter, you understand that change is the only constant thing, even though it's the most difficult thing. It took Jesus to be very radical it is. for things to happen. It is. Things must change. It's, I agree. But Jesus said uh, he didn't come to change the law. You know, he came to do it a new way. I agree wholeheartedly with you. Like I said, let a time come that people do it anyhow. Okay. But in our time, I do not see these changes. And I'm not also saying for the people who argue the other way. That's why I've qualified my statement. My statement is that as long as the judges control their courts, they have a discretion. What the Chief Justice wrote is a kind of reminder. The Chief Justice did not say that every judge is a, is a kind of, you take it this way, the, the way it must be. Right. It is not true. Let, let's hear from uh, Randolph uh, Chumisi Ankara. And um, you know, I've, I've read you somewhere and you seem to support the view that things must change. Uh, somebody was talking about a junior complaining that he got to court, he gets to, he got to court one day or in the morning, he got there before seniors came, and then seniors have come, dealt with their cases, and he's left, and he's not happy until, you know, late in the afternoon. 
don't you subscribe to the view that this tradition is a good one? It's something. I do not condemn the tradition as bad. But however, we have to look at the fact that traditions evolve with time. My learned senior, whom I'm doing so many cases with, he seems to have forgotten, mm -hmm. but <laughs> has made a point that traditions must be maintained. But we have to look at the purpose of each tradition. Now, going directly to the directive issued by the Chief Justice, the underlying reasoning for his directive is that so that juniors will learn. Now, I have had the opportunity to be in courts where the judge will tell you that, you know what, the days of Darocha and Jorindov are over. I'm not ready to sit and listen to you talk for 10, 5 minutes. Go and put everything in writing. Right. So we should also admit that those days of advocacy in court is whittling That's away. Right. So there is no need for anybody to go and sit in court and say, I'm, trying to, I'm going to learn from a senior. Because there's no advocacy in the court. Everything is written down. Only a few of the judges would allow you 10, 15, 20 minutes to be on your feet to talk. So in my view, so long as we are practicing evolving over time, automatically some traditions will whittle away. Now you made a point that um, Oliver Wendell Holmes stated that the life of the law has been experienced. You know the venerable law, then he disagreed. And said it's been logic. <laughs> so and, and logic is not a preserve of any particular person. Right. You may be a junior at the bar or a senior at the bar, but someone who relatively is written, you may have maybe in terms of logic stronger than you. And now to the extent that the directive is premised on the benefit that it gives to juniors that they are coming to learn. My, something, I believe there's a reason why every lawyer called to the bar is supposed to do pupillage. The understanding is that you go and train under a senior for a minimum six months, by which period you are able to stand on your own and practice. These days you do internship first. You even do so cumulatively. You have a year of studying, under studying a senior. Unless, of course, we doubt the training that people get when they go to... Are you suggesting that is enough? No, I'm, I'm saying that... I mean, I have had the benefit of sitting in the, in the class of the Venerable Justice of the Supreme Court now in Megache, where he indicated that for him, once you are called to the bar, you are a lawyer fully and competent and ready to practice. And that when he meets you, he's going to treat you as a lawyer of full of his equal standing. Yes, we meet our lecturers and All the rest the of them, and we are not treated differently. Exactly, really. because, so, because the understanding is that mm. you are capable in your, pro, in your training. Unless, of course, we have, a, we have doubts or reservations about the training we may have given the people, then, in my view, some of these strict adherence to certain traditions, which automatically are even evolving because the practice dynamics have changed. The practice started with apprenticeship. Exactly. You didn't have to go to a law school. You didn't have to. So this is why this, this is continuing. But now you have to go to a law school where what you would have learned under a senior by way of understanding for years have all been codified. You go, you pick the books, you study them, you have the benefit of learning, I mean, minimum one year under a senior, come mm. out, and you're even practicing in the chamber where right. you, have, so you are supervised on a daily basis by a particular senior. You go to court to hold, most of the cases, even hold equal. their brief, mm. which means that you are coming with the full, and you are speaking in, on their behalf. So in my view, a, an ad, a strict adherence to traditions, which I have indicated, have already evolved. Mm. It's a bit of a stretch, in my view. Okay. And I prefer that the CJ would allow judges to stick to their case management timetables or plan, and in their own discretion, where they think necessary, give some leeway to persons that they deem deserve it. All right. And it must be said that in the courts, we know of judges who give you time. They don't really give you a date to come to court. They give you a time. If they say, I'm going to hear you at 9, they will hear you at 9. If you are there after 9, you've lost it. Um, and a host of other things. So I suppose I am saying that I believe that what should be engaging our attention should not be about calling a senior or a junior, but how I could get my case started, dispensed with in a very short time. So that even if I'm doing a land matter, I can, I can do it within six months. You are done. You know? that I can pick a phone and argue my ex parte application without going to court We're and wasting for that money. Day. We're right. waiting for that day. Okay, thank you. Thank you so very much. Now, um, let's go to the issue that, you know, is uh, raising a lot of eyebrows. Now, 
let's begin with you, uh, Kuku. That it's unheard of to have had the court injunct the MP. Not at all. Not in my view. Indeed, and in fact, my starting point is, if you weigh both sides, I'm talking about the seven judges, if you synthesize everything that they said, the minority, all that they said was that the same relief that was being sought in the Supreme Court had already crystallized, but they needed to have used a different path to achieve what they wanted in the Supreme Court. So therefore, between the two sides, they all agree that once the High Court had concluded that the MP had lost it, and that he was not entitled to have contested in the very first place. He ought to be thrown out of parliament. The only difference between them is that the majority decided that by reason of the rate that had been put before the Supreme Court, they could rely on it as a basis for granting the interim injunction that they have sought which in term injunction indeed has the effect of permanently injuncting him. But that is no strange to the law. That is no new to the law. There is authority for the proposition that in an application for an interim injunction, if it, the, the, the facts merit it, the court could grant a final injunction. In other words, a permanent injunction. This is not the first time. So I see this, when people say travesties of justice, I don't understand it. And that's my view of the matter. Mm. Just a major chair, Justice Doji. Doji. They said, oh, no, it's, it's procedure. Doji, not Doji. Doji, Doji. Yeah. Agnes Doji. Yeah. Her leadership, Justice Agnes Doji. 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 Mm. Their case simply is that it's about procedure, but even then I disagree with them. Because there is also authority for the proposition that, notwithstanding the fact that you've got a judgment, which is a final one, if the means of enforcing it is closed or frustrated, you could bring a fresh action to enforce. There is authority for the proposition under the common law of bringing a fresh action to enforce a judgment, a valid judgment of a court. Except that this is my first time of this fresh action being brought in the Supreme Court. I think that's the question. That the first so. action you're talking about, should it be in the Supreme Court? That is so. That is so. So, the, the, so it's about it's about them. I mean, the, the, that application itself, in so far as it turned upon an interpretation of the constitution. Obviously, under our laws, that's the only forum. That is to say, the Supreme Court, where you can call upon the Supreme Court to interpret. In this case, I think it's Article 94.2 of the Constitution. So, therefore, even though it is addressed as a constitutional question for the Supreme Court to interpret that section. We have no doubt, I have no doubt in my mind, that that same matter had more or less been ruled upon by the High Court. Call it ingenuity, call it whatever name, but a rose smells as good by whatever name you call it. So as long as that matter is the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has already determined, and we can tell by reason of the position that the majority are taking, that they would also uphold the main issue that is before the court. Mm. I can also state that by reason of the reasoning the minority have given, they will also rule against that writ that has been issued in the Supreme Court as incompetent. So at the end of the day, the matter has been resolved for all of us. There's no travesty of justice in so far as the high court ruling remains unchallenged. There's no travesty of justice in so far as the court of appeal, the matter has been struck. The, the minority's view is that if you have procured a judgment in the high court, yes. that nullifies his election that is so. and orders a rerun. So. And in fact, there was an injunction in terim, and there was also a perpetual injunction on the back of that judgment. That is so. What you do is to enforce that judgment. The place to enforce that judgment is in the high court, not in the Supreme Court. That is wrong. If you say, as they argued, that he had breached and violated the judgment and not complied, if that is your view, then 
your recourse is to go back to the high court and cite him for contempt. You didn't do all of that. So Nene Amegache concludes that or makes the point that the, let me read him. He says that, he says that um, a breach of the order of injunction issued by the high court should have been enforced by the high court or the court of appeal. Then he proceeds to say that um, the Supreme Court is not the forum to employ legal ingenuity by the filing of a constitutional action and then disguise this application <coughs> as an offshoot of the writ, while in substance an enforcement of the High Court orders, which is not an appeal before us. I quite get that, that argument. But essentially, we say fundamental problems require fundamental solutions. We live in a country, you've noticed the difficulty even of service in all this legal drama that has rolled or unfolded before our eyes. And therefore, it's about the practicality of enforcing the judgment of the high court through a contempt application, and their fallout, and so forth and so on. I'm not thinking that in every situation that we find ourselves in, in an attempt to enforce, because I've already made a point that a judgment of a court on the common law can be enforced by a fresh action. And I repeat that for that reason, insofar as this has been couched as a constitutional issue, it is the Supreme Court that is the proper forum where this matter can then go to. As to whether the Supreme Court will come to a conclusion that by reason of its repetition, in other words, what the Supreme Court has done is nothing really different from what the High Court has already determined. And indeed, and in fact, by grant of the injunction, that injunction, even a permanent one, has already been given by the High Court. Mm. So indeed, and in fact, in my honest view, it's a repetition. Of for, for the period that the injunction from the High Court, the permanent one, that is so. and the order or the judgment of the court was pending, mm -hmm. he had taken steps. Mm -hmm. Which steps allowed him to continue to be in Parliament, which allowed him not to obey the judgment. He had filed an appeal, and he was also seeking to stay execution. So within that period, he was not disobeying anything, was he? He was. As a matter of law, the filing of application for stay does not operate as a stay. Stay of execution. That is so. It does not operate as a stay. Let's part further. I don't want us to be talking too much law on this platform, but the point of the matter is that if the court has made an order, the order ought to be obeyed. And indeed, if I have filed an application for stay of execution of that order, the court ought to rule. You cannot take a license from dependency of an application for stay as itself a stay of the order to enable you do things in direct disobedience of the order. So that's how complicated this matter is. If it and does not operate case, as a stay, yes. then you'll be overreaching the courts. Not because sure. the issue for the court to determine, you would have gone ahead to implement it. So what is there to stay? I thought that stay of execution, as we understand, once you file it, it stays the hand of the one who is supposed to implement the judgment until it has been determined. If you take that view. But okay. I will say, if you take that view, that every time that you file a care for stay of execution, the order from which you are seeking the, uh, the relief is naturally or automatically stay. I may disagree with Once you are served with it. Once I'm served with it. Is the Supreme Court itself has said that the mere fact that you disagree with an order, even if you have applied for a stay, does not give you the relief. You must still ensure compliance. But like I'm saying, I don't want us to be arguing this point. But even then, it breaks down at a point where your appeal is safe. It's struck out. Mm. Because other than that, we have a fiction of dependency of processes and gymnastics and so forth and so on. If your appeal from which or in respect of which your application for stay is safe or spending mm. is struck out, would we in fairness say that you've got something before the court? There is absolutely nothing. So indeed and in fact, what, is, what was really happening was the fact that 
by result to filing of all kinds of processes, the applicant, I'm talking about the honorable question, was giving himself a new lease of life by filing all these. If the law are forcing, why is, not? No, no, the point of the matter is that they were legally defective, defective in the sense that once your substantive appeal, I'll grant you an agreement that, of course, if you had filed, the in fairness to him, he ought to. But what up to the point that his application is, I'm talking about the appeal itself, was struck out. That's very and, recently. And, and yeah, very recently. From the point he was struck out, as we understand, um, he had been asked by his party people not to participate in the house. And from what we understand, that is what was going on. But we now, can't recognize what his party people have told him. Let's look at the processes in the court. That, that, the best way, that meant he was complying. No, 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 no. no. I mean, at the time his appeal was off, that yeah. meant he was complying. Now the question here is the generality of the Ghanaian people. Mm -hmm. um, those who do not have the benefits of a legal education. Sure. Some are asking a question. Do you think that they have a genuine concern when they ask the question that when it comes to James Jachi Kwesi, he's been injuncted. But there are other parliamentary election petitions that are pending, and the courts refuse to grant an injunction on the basis that he should not be deprived, the constituency should not be deprived of representation. When the matter is finally dealt with, then it will be known, just like the minority held in the Supreme Court decision. So if you remember, there was this matter in, uh, uh, what is his name? Uh, the former Lance Minister's place. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, sure. Then we have another matter in Techiman. Yes. And in all, in all those cases, as we understand, the court has refused, refused injunction on that principle. And they also refer to the court's recent decision in the Abdullahi case, mm -hmm. where it said that the MP as deputy speaker must not be denied representation of his people. How do you explain to those people to come to terms with the fact that there can be different cases <laughs> where there can be an injunction and where there will not be an injunction. <laughs> I find it very interesting. <laughs> but I'll still answer your question. The, the, I think, first and foremost, we need to appreciate that every application for injunction is founded on its peculiar facts. And therefore, at the end of the day, the judges do a balancing act to find out on the probability, on the balance of probabilities, whether there's a substantive matter that ought to agitate their mind sufficiently to grant it or not to grant it. I've read a judgment with the Supreme Court written by my good friend, Leonard Justice Kulendi. I think the most important factor that weighed in the minds of the majority was the fact that they took cognizance, they took knowledge of the fact that there is already a judgment of the High Court that effectively determined this matter to finality. And the fact that in the Court of Appeal, indeed, and in fact, somewhere down the line, they, they made reference to the fact that even though the allegation was made that the appeal had been struck out in the Court of Appeal and they had not apply to relist or something like that. There, there, is, in, there is an application to relist. Well, I do not know yeah. of that. There is. Well, I do not know of that. Yeah, yeah, I do not know of that. But the, 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 the Supreme Court has said that they found the allegation that the appeal had been struck as undenied. And therefore, on that basis, they had taken the clear position that there's nothing really to go for question. And for that reason, they are entitled to grant the order. Now, this case of the, 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 the distinction that we seek to draw between other constituencies being denied MPs and the constituency not being denied MPs, I think we need to go further to look at what are the facts of the various cases that makes that distinction clear or unclear. In other words, in that of question, the issue is not merely of representation. It is the issue of his qualification 
to represent the people to begin with. It's not a mere election petition in the sense of people fighting over results and so forth and so on, which is the case in Techman and so forth and so on. The question of representation doesn't change regardless of the nature of the suit. Well, the opposition, I don't, I don't agree. And I'll, I'll go ahead and make the point that... It's a question. Well, so I'll go ahead and make the point that where it's a question of eligibility, the issue is, are the people better off getting an unrepresentative person to sit in parliament to purport or pretend to represent them? Is that in the eyes of justice, in the eyes of the law, in constitutionalism, would you rather that somebody who does not qualify to represent you must sit in parliament and we claim that he's representing the people? Because what it means in effect is that his presence there is itself an abomination, if I may use that word, which is a different situation altogether. For a court, and this is the issue that people are raising in support of the minority view. Yes. As in the minority of the court. That is so. Um, Nenea Megache and Agnes Doji. If the court says, we are going to expedite the trial for this case mm -hmm. and make sure that this case ends quickly. That's for sure. And this is a case in which everything they need to file for the case to be determined have already been filed. The only thing that is outstanding is the memorandum of issues. So it has ordered them to file the memorandum of issues by the 27th or 25th. So if this court is minded to dispense with this matter in a week or two, why, what's the hurry in stopping the MP from being in parliament for a week or two? Well, it's the court, in my view, is the court appreciation or court's view of how grievous the situation is, and the fact that they would rather deal with it, even if it is a day left for them to give their decision. Because they say it's a constitutional breach. That is so. It's an, their abhorrence of what they consider to be an unconstitutionality, that they ought to deal with it decisively, so as not to give impetus, to give energy, to give strength to other people who may wish to toy with similar issues mm. in the future. That's my own view of this matter. Right. And the majority view, they said that we are not unmindful of the fact that if we grant the instant application and the first respondent in the end be adjudged by this court as duly qualified to have filed a nomination and for that matter be elected member of parliament, he would have suffered damage loss and injury on account of an interlocutory restraint. Similarly, his constituents, as well as the party on whose ticket he is in parliament, would have been affected. Consequently, the absence of the first respondent, that is James Jachi Kwesin, even if temporarily, will occasion some inconvenience. So they admit that there will be some inconvenience. <clears throat> that is, in the end, if they determine the case and he won, that is so. then they come to the other side. On the other hand, the applicant at, the, at paragraph 12 of his affidavit in support points to the constitutional nature of his suit and laments of, quote, untold distress and loss, end quote, for himself and other constituents of Asin North who ought not to have, quote, being saddled with an unqualified person to contest the parliamentary elections of that constituency, unquote, in the first place. And that, quote, this distress and loss are irreparable and can in no way be remedied by the award of damages, end quote. Don't you find, Chumensi, that they have balanced the equation so well. Well, Samson, before I answer your question, there are some few questions that I need us to look at. Mm. Now, the Supreme Court decision presupposes the existence of a particular fact, which is that there is a high court decision. Now, to appreciate where the Supreme Court came from, whether you subscribe to the minority view or the majority view, you would have to interrogate the High Court decision. 
If you look at the High Court decision, especially page 61, mm. where the High Court granted the relief sought by the petitioner, that's Michael Nifa, the court actually declared the election of Honorable Quason as void, now and of no effect. It then went ahead in relief F to order the Electoral Commission to hold a new election. So, and we must also understand that this decision predates the filing of the writ in the Supreme Court. That's right. So the, at the time the writ was filed in the Supreme Court, what was the state of affairs? The state of affairs was that Honorable Quason had been declared as unqualified, unfit, and his election nullified. That was the state of affairs. So from that time forward, he was no longer to be accorded the right as an MP. And that was the decision. So if we appreciate that this was the decision of the, of the High Court, which decision in itself is effective and valid, and by the principle of experts, as my colleague has already alluded to, even if it is wrong, you must apply, you must abide by it. So if you all agree that the High Court nullified this election, then what, what was the essence of the Supreme Court action? Is it the case that the victorious party in the High Court was not so convinced about the victory it had gotten from the High Court that it was seeking a reaffirmation or a validation of the High Court decision. Because, and I say so because if you look at, this is the writ in the Supreme Court. The reliefs sought are five. These are the same reliefs that were sought in the High Court. There's no difference. The only difference in, is, in, is semantics. So if the High Court actually has given all of this to you. But as we understand, yes. in the Supreme Court, they are seeking interpretation of Article 94, Clause 2A. Exactly. Whether or not he had allegiance, owed allegiance to a country other than Ghana. Perfect. Before he filed his nomination and throughout the process. Something. I, I, I'll address that issue. But I want you to under, also appreciate the fact that this issue surfaced in the High Court. And the High Court relied on the Certificate of Renunciation, which was evidence, and stated that from that, the, on the face of the certificates, he owed allegiance and was a citizen of Canada at the time. But that notwithstanding, I'm making this point to drive home the fact that at the time when they came to the Supreme Court, the man was not an MP. So there was nothing, so restraining him from doing that was, is in my view, a bit of a stretch. Because if there is a substantive decision which says that you are not an MP, then what are we restraining you from? So, and that is why I side with the major, minority decision that the remedy available to you was to pursue enforcement of the decision. And because that was actually what the High Court directed. And the, reven the avenues for enforcement are a lot. In fact, if you look at Article 1125, I expected either uh, Honorable Quason himself or the Electoral Commission or the Victorious Party in that case to have written to the Clerk of Parliament that a vacancy has occurred in this by virtue of the Supreme Court, the High Court decision, to so proceed to hold an election. And if the, the, the plaintiff in that case felt that that is not the position, then he could have actually appealed or gone to the Supreme Court to seek to stop them. That notwithstanding, let's look at the, the point you asked. Balance of convenience, Samson. Mm. The, the, I mean, the Supreme Court's jurisdiction for this application was invoked first one to order 25 of CI 47. And we know that under order 25, the court is supposed to assess whether it is just to do so. Now, the court did a balancing and came to the, in fact, like you said, the court itself admitted that an inconvenience be occasioned to the people of uh, Asen North, not necessarily the person uh, of Mr. Honorable yes. Quason, but the people of Asen because they will not have a representation. But then again, they win. Especially if, if in the end, he wins. He won the case. Yes, if in the end he wins, you've occasioned an, an irreparable damage. And we know that one of the main factors that must weigh in the grant or otherwise of injunction application is if at the end of the day, the damage caused cannot be repaired. So the question I was expecting the Supreme Court to answer would have been, how would that damage that they admit would have occurred if he won in the end be repaired? As well as the people of his constituency, how would it have been repaired? That notwithstanding this, I mean, his Lordship Kulendi also made fantastic arguments that it's a, it's a constitution that has been breached. And mm -hmm. I agree with him because at that point in time, there was a substantive decision of the, of the High Court. And that is where I also disagree with him because if you 
admit that there was a decision of the high court which states for a fact that the man is not an MP. Then what you should have actually done was to direct them to enforce the decision against him. Mm. And you will notice Justice Amegache and Justice Agnes Doji kept stating the fact that if the man is disobeying the order of the high court, you have several remedies available to you, citing for contempt. I mean, my learned friend has raised the issue of difficulty with service of process. Samson, we are all practitioners. Mm. We know if personal service is, is not practical, the law allows you to come for substitute service. And I even recall that in the substantive matter before the Supreme Court, substitute service were ordered at some point in time. That's right. So every challenge that the people were encountering, I think the law provided a remedy. So in my view, in my view, since there was nothing to even present before the Supreme Court at the time, because the man was not an MP, there was the injunction restraining him is just an addition to a factual situation which was already there. It doesn't really change the fact as it is. Because in my view, Honorable Quayson, as it stands today, it's not an MP. Let's look at an, an issue that um, um, Kuku brings up in this discussion. He says that if you look at the five, the five justices who held in favor of the application to injunct him, he can see the end of this case. In the same way, if you look at the minority, he can also see where they stand. Is that possible? Something I, I don't subscribe to that thinking because we are familiar with instances where, let me give you a very typical example. Uh, this case of Republic versus um, forgotten. Uh, there's this case where that a bank gave the lead judgment and it was unanimous. Then there was a review, and the team that joined him abandoned him, and then set aside the original decision, and it became seven two or seven one eight one. So the fact that a court has taken a decision. In fact, the court can even agree to grant you some preliminary matters and the substantive matter to change their position. Mm. This is not a decision on the merits of what Article 94.2a means. It is whether or not we should grant you your application. Like my colleague said, they relied on the factual situations that were put mm. before them. And the factors for granting the application include whether or not you have a case. Exactly. And in this matter, the court asks itself, whether there is a serious matter of interpretation that, has, that it has to exercise its mind on. And it came to that view that, yes, there is. But for coming to that agreement, it will not have granted the injunction. Exactly. So I, do you think he may be right in how he suggests? No, no, no. I, I, don't, I, don't have, I wouldn't say he's wrong, but I don't subscribe to his thinking because... Mm. Like I indicated, a court stating that there's an issue for interpretation does not necessarily mean that they will agree with the case or the plaintiff. Okay. Because we agree that on the face of it, there's a question. But as to how you answer the question, we don't know as it stands now. So we cannot say that because we are staying our hands pending the answering of that question. And we said that because there's a serious question, then automatically we are going to answer the question in the affirmative. I don't, I don't think so. At the, at the risk of contempt, when you hear, you know, Her Ladyship Agnes Doji say that, as far as she is concerned, no she, says, she says, I hold, therefore, that the applicant has failed to establish that there is a serious question before us to be tried. Meaning, the case they have brought is useless. Then, Nana Megache proceeds, joins her, and comes to say that the Supreme Court is not a place. He says the Supreme Court is not the forum to employ legal ingenuity by the filing of a constitutional action and then disguise this application as an offshoot of the writ, while in substance an enforcement of the High Court orders, which is not an appeal before us. Does this tell you at least that these two are minded to say that the applicants, the case they have brought, there's no question of interpretation? Well, you see, it's something. One of the factors to determine by a court in granting an application for injunction is whether or not there's a serious issue. 
in determining whether there's a serious issue, the law is that you have to look at the pleadings, the, the rates, the reliefs that have been sought. Now, in their minds, and you, you notice that when I started my submission, I referred you to the rate filed in the Supreme Court, and I compared it to the rate in the High Court. That's right. That the reliefs are the same. And I also indicated that the Supreme Court decision presupposes an existence of a, the existence of a fact, which is that Honorable Quayson, at the time of the issuance of the rate in the Supreme Court, was not an MP, because nobody can dispute the fact that that is what led to the conclusion of the majority. So her leadership, Agnes Doji, took the view if the High Court has already answered the question, and the man as it stands now is not an MP, then what are we wasting our time over? So with that, with the benefit of that, you can say that in her mind, or to her, there is nothing for us to even debate over in the first place, mm. whether today or tomorrow, because the issue has already been determined, especially so when there is no appeal pending. Okay. Now, now <laughs> Kuku, you, from how you put it, yeah. maybe for... Justice Agnes Doji. Sure. You can say that as far as she's concerned, her mind is made up. That is true. Because of the way she put it, that That's there's no serious issue to be tried. There's nothing before them as far but as she's concerned. But Nene Amegache yes. does not exactly say that there is no issue to be tried. And then the five, they say there's an issue. But saying there's an issue does not mean that they will grant the, the release that is being sought by Nympha or... Yes, you yeah. see, every time that a matter comes before the Supreme Court, the first issue really, sometimes when every time an objection is raised, is whether the question before they raise a constitutional issue. That's the first thing before they even go to the merits. That's right. In other words, can These you. These days they will throw you out from the very preliminary stage. That is so. That is so. So, therefore, the issue then is there's a constitutional issue arise for determination by this court on the basis of Article 942A yes. of the Constitution. Irrespective of whether the same matter has been raised mm -hmm. anywhere by way of some reliefs that the person sought, because every form that you go, depending on what you're looking for, mm -hmm. you're going to get something from that court. It need not be a constitutional matter at all. Right. So like I've said, the, the matter that started in the High Court did not start as a constitutional issue. In other words, it started as a matter to compel an MP to vacate his seat on the basis that he did not meet the requirement of the law and so forth and so on. But I read somewhere in the brief that it's because this matter came repeating itself all over the place and because even though as a matter of fact or as a matter of law rather, the jury, the high court had pronounced, in fact, Quinson was still putting himself up as an MP. So we had a de jure situation where the High Court had ruled, and we had a situation where by filing all manner of processes, mm. Quinson had arrogated to himself the option, or rather the position of an MP. So those two situations existed as a matter of fact and as a matter of law. And this is what, in my view, compelled the... I'm talking about the original plaintiff. Now to repeat this application more or less in the mm -hmm. Supreme Court, call it disguise, call it whatever name, a rosemary is as good by whatever name you call it. But once it came into the Supreme Court, it came as a constitutional issue. Mm -hmm. And in my view, mm -hmm. I will go ahead and speculate that the Supreme Court will first hold that that was a proper issue that is fit to be raised. That's where the, the question side mm -hmm. say that in the high court, mm -hmm. they have sought to ask the question whether or not the judge has the power to interpret the provision of the constitution. And that, is it not the case that this matter has to be referred to the Supreme Court? Because the law says, when it comes to interpretation of the constitution, it is only the Supreme Court that has the power to do so. So, actually, Abraham, Abraham Malba says that, it is his arguments that they have now brought to the high court. So if the court agrees, then it means that the high court failed in not recognizing that it didn't have the power to proceed with the case without referring that aspect of the constitutional question to the Supreme Court for a determination. That could as well be the case. 
that crash will be the case. I'm making a supposition and run right. my argument over it. Mm. But if the constitution, I'm let the Supreme Court first hold that this is a real constitutional issue that whichever way possibly ought to have come here first. Now they have held. We, we, we can take it for Good. granted Good. that there's a real issue. Good. Now, the next step they have to take is for us to consider whether indeed, after holding that, and even if they were to hold that, the High Court ought not to have tried the matter, whether that would be it. In other words, do they throw out the, I mean, did they throw out the matter that was before the High Court on the basis that the judge now have the jurisdiction and allow question to go back where they themselves on the facts and the evidence before them have found out that he did not qualify in the very first place. Okay. So, so this essential legal gymnastics, because at the end <laughs> of it, in my view, the Supreme mm. Court would come to the same conclusion that the High Court came to, mm. unless there's some presentation of some new facts, which they have, that we do not have, on the basis of which things will change. Mm. If, if, if I may. Um, quickly, and let me bring in Professor Kofi Abuchi. Yes. Mm. If I may. You know, the point just made by my friend indicates clearly that, as already said, we do not dispute the fact that as at January 2022 or 2021... When, he, when the, this case was taken to when, the Supreme Court... The man did not, was not an MP. He, his uh, MP ship had MP, been nullified. Had, had been nullified by the High Court. If the Supreme Court today... Except had, that he was still carrying on because he had filed an appeal and had filed an application to stay this uh, so let me, execution. Let me just bring in, you see, if you look at PNDC Law 284, Section 10, and you look at the case of Dansu Echampong versus Attorney General and Daniel Abudapi, you know, in Abudapi's case, when he was convicted, there was an issue. Dansu Echampong of Blessed Memory took him to the Supreme Court and said that by virtue of the conviction, his seat is vacant. And the Supreme Court said no. Under Section 10 of this law, once he's pursuing his appeals, a seat cannot be declared vacant, but that provision was limited to convictions. That is not the facts we have here. Mm. You may, depend on the school of interpretation you belong to, you may say that, oh, the literalist, let's adopt the literalist and keep to what the law is, or let's rely on purposive and read into it these factual situations. But as it stands now, the law does not apply to that factual situation. So in my view, the filing of the appeal, as my friend has already indicated, does not, and there are a lot of authorities, does not stay Execution of your judgment. Not the appeal. The, the stay of execution. The, stay, the filing of the stay in itself does not even operate. Because you notice in the case of uh, this very old case of Malam Isa, a lot of such applications were filed. And the Supreme Court took the view that the filing of even stay of execution of proceedings does not stop the proceedings. So the case will go on. Stay of proceedings or execution? Execution does not stop it. So this is the position of the law. Unless a court in its own wisdom decides to grant the application. But until the application is granted, you are at liberty to proceed with your enforcement. Okay. In this case, steps have not, have not even been taken to even enforce the matter in the, the judgment in the first place. So we all admit the factual situation that the man does not qualify. It's not even, not even about qualification. It's not an MP. Right. So what is the Supreme Court going to say differently? Mm. Okay, um, hold on there. Let's go to Professor Kofi Abuchi. Uh, thank you very much for your time, for joining us. And um, our viewers and listeners, please, we are careful not to seek to pronounce on Article 20, 94 2A, because that is the provision that the Supreme Court has been invited to determine on this matter. So if you don't get us referring to whether, in fact, at the time he was filing his nomination, at the time he was elected, at the time he was sworn in, whether he, he held a dual citizenship, and dual citizenship is the same as owing allegiance to another country, uh, it is the reason. But the facts we know are that a year before he ran for elections, he had filed to renounce his Canadian citizenship. By November 2020, he received a renunciation certificate. But that was after he had filed his nomination. Then the issue came up, somebody raised it, and the Electoral Commission was invited to disqualify him. The Electoral Commission, as we understand, assessed the circumstances and said that he was qualified to go ahead. That's how we understand the issues. So he went ahead. So by the time of his election, and by the time when he was being sworn in, he had received a renunciation certificate from Canada except that 
The other argument is that in that same renunciation certificate, it says that unless, or the processes, the Canadians insist that unless you have received the renunciation certificate, your application has not been granted and you still remain a citizen of Canada. Professor Kukwasari refers us to Section 20 of the Mother Election Law in Ghana. It's called the Representation of the People Act, which says that your qualification to contest election is a question of time, which is important. If at the time of your election you had issues, then you, um, you will be disqualified or you have been disqualified. But if at the time of your election, he says, if at the time, by the time of his election, he had already renounced. At the time he was sworn in in parliament, he had already renounced. And, therefore, and he had also gotten the renunciation certificate. And therefore, there's no issue as far as he's concerned. Professor Abuchi, uh, thank you very much. What do you think about the Supreme Court's decision, uh, which uh, President Mahama says is a travesty of justice, and the NDC particularly is very unhappy about? Well, first of all, I think that the Supreme Court was actually presented with a novelty. And I did not see that in the judgment. I did not see the court specifically address the novelty. There's a novelty, and I have to respectfully say that I haven't even heard that from the commentary either. I think the discussion has been gone about generally as if we're dealing with a situation that recurs. The idea of presenting an injunction to the Supreme Court, an application for injunction to the Supreme Court at first instance, appears to be a novelty. And the reason it's a novelty for me is the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction only in one thing and that is original jurisdiction in matters concerning the constitutionality or the interpretation of aspects of the Constitution. Otherwise, the Supreme Court has appellate jurisdiction. By the practices of the courts, over the years, the application for injunction itself has evolved. Formerly, you could make an application for injunction in the abstract. Now you cannot make an application for injunction in the abstract. You need to bring your application for injunction as a surplusage on an existing application, or rather an existing process, an existing uh, matter which is ongoing. And so that novelty which I see is the novelty of a matter being brought to the Supreme Court per an application for injunction at a time, and if my timing is correct, at the time when there was no substantive, uh, substantive application yeah. pending before the Supreme Court or substantive matter for determination pending yeah, before the Supreme Court. I think the court went ahead to assume jurisdiction and uh, my reading of the judgment, the court invariably and correctly apply the principle that said the court can assume jurisdiction the court can assume jurisdiction in all matters in which lower courts can assume jurisdiction that is correct but lower courts can only assume jurisdiction in matters that involve a substantive matter ongoing in respect of which an application for injunction caps that matter from the timing again it doesn't seem that at the time the application for injunction was brought there was a substantive matter before the supreme court so that could be one um, small problematic aspect of the, the assumption of jurisdiction in this respect. And I think the minority were at pains to try and point out something like that, not exactly in the terms in which I'm saying it, um, from my view and my perspective, but clearly the minority saw a difficulty in terms of the course assuming jurisdiction. And indeed, they went about partly also drawing attention to the fact that the applicant was, in essence, trying to seek from the Supreme Court something which has already been granted and something which barely could be an enforcement um, issue. Indeed, the Supreme Court's jurisdiction, both in terms of the declarative jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and then the enforcement jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, this is a matter that has been debated between the justices over the years. And it's a fine line because the argument has partly been said that, look, if you are interpreting aspects of the Constitution, the interpretation itself involves enforcement because it will invariably end in a declaration and it will invariably usually end in an order. So I'm not going to go into that issue of whether they said, I mean, whether we're for the court for enforcement or the, the, the applicant was before the court for declaration. So these were the, the difficulty. But the novelty of the matter, I think, therefore, implicated one fundamental thing. The court went ahead to apply the principles of injunction in a manner that is absolutely correct if you are dealing with conventional injunctions. And I'm just saying conventional injunction because it seems to me that over the years, the court has not adverted its mind, respectfully, to the fact that the issue of constitution. 
Um, Professor Abuchi's uh, Zoom is frozen. We'll get him uh, fixed and get back. But uh, I saw the two of you yeah. nodding in some vehement disagreement no, on the no, point that he was making. Agreement. Agreement. No, agreement. Okay. About what, what Professor Abuchi said, what mm -hmm. he claims to be a novelty. He assumes that there was no substantive matter in the Supreme Court. To that extent, he's wrong. There is indeed a writ. That's right. So the injunction was founded on... The writ was filed in January 2022. Yes, on That's right. The 24th of January 2022. So, so right. there's okay. a substantive writ before the Supreme Court on the basis of which the application for injunction was founded. So to the extent that he makes the case that there was no matter before the court, because we all know as elementary law, we respect that, there should always be some originating matter before, before, the the court, before the injunction. So okay. the novelty that he perceives indeed is misconceived. Okay, so I was right. You were nodding in disagreement in vehemently. Agreement. <laughs> uh, not in agreement. In agreement, yeah, disagreement. <laughs> uh, okay, 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 okay. Okay, that's right. Okay. Uh, Professor Abochi, are you back? Hello, Prof. Yes, I'm back. Yes. Unfortunately, yes, yes, I'm back. So, did you hear? Did you hear the feedback from your colleagues in the studio? No, not quite. I'll be okay. I'll that's be happy to that hear. you. You have sought to say, or you said that the novelty you are referring to has to do with the fact that there is no substantive matter before the Supreme Court to entertain an injunction, but that is incorrect because there was the uh, writ invoking the Supreme Court's original interpretive jurisdiction to deal with Article uh, 94-2A, which was filed in January Correct. of 2022. Okay, so that's why I indicated that if my timing is correct, because I, I, to be honest, I wasn't quite sure of the timing. My understanding was that the application for the application invoking the substantive jurisdiction of the Supreme Court was filed after the application for injunction was filed. Not, not at all. Not at all. Okay. Yes. Well advised. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me, please? We can hear you. Okay. Well advised. But I was then proceeding to speak about the issue of the novelty or the novelty of, of these matters and the need for specific application to the issue of constitutional injunctions. I think that the principles of constitutional injunctions, and indeed the court very correctly identified the, the parties involved in terms of who is the injured party. Um, I think uh, Professor Abuchi's line is not helping. Um, in respect of the question of the injured party, I suppose that he was going to refer to the fact, uh, the point that the Supreme Court made in the majority decision, more particularly that the, yes, both really, that uh, we as citizens have a community of interest in the constitution. So if the constitution is being breached, it is not just about the individuals, yeah. either the applicant or the respondent, but also all of us are affected. And the constitution actually calls upon all of us to do everything to protect uh, the democracy if it is being subverted. Professor Bucci, are you on? Um, uh, yes, I'm on. Good, okay. good, good. Yes. Please proceed. Can you, can you hear me, please? Yes, please. Hello? I can hear you. Yes. So the court clearly identified who the injured part the judge identified who the injured party was and repeatedly addressed its mind to who stood to lose in this. I think identifying the question of who the injured party was of necessity then deals with the issue also of what the relevant principles to apply is. It seems to me that even though the court identified properly who the injured party was, the court went ahead to apply the, the standard and the orthodox principles of injunctions to this. One of which being the question of the adequacy of compensation by way of damages in the event that the, the matter goes in one direction or the other. I think that the principles of damages which are normally applied when it comes to the question of uh, injunctions, damages and convenience and those standard principles, and the court invoked the case of, uh, relied on the case of Ousu and Ousu. It seems to me that those are extremely inadequate in matters of constitutional principle, uh, constitutional injunctions. And I think the court was handicapped because, frankly, over the years, the court has been applying the orthodox principles 
of injunction to, to constitutional principles, or rather to constitutional matters of injunction. And I think that for the first time, the court actually adverted its mind to who stood to lose. In my opinion, I was quite excited, actually, when I saw that the court adverted its mind to that. I was hoping that the court would have then gone ahead to construct unique and standard principles for deciding matters of constitutional injunctions, and indeed what the standard thresholds are. In other jurisdictions, they've, they've, they've devised things like what you call the heightened scrutiny, heightened scrutiny in determining matters of constitutional rights, among others. Now, the reason for heightened scrutiny is that the court would then, for example, require higher standards of proof from a party making a claim. The court will require that the, the determination of balances, balances of rights and liabilities, are looked at very carefully. And the court considers, among others, what lawyers would normally call sui generis principles, that is, principles that are unique to that particular case. So I, I was very happy to see that the court was alive and active in terms of its thinking to the peculiarities of the case. However, the application of the principle itself ultimately ended up with the standard old orthodox principles that we've always had in regular injunctions, in matters involving parties where a party would have gone and sought from the courts the freezing of rights in the meantime, pending the determination of matters. And those ones, in my opinion, respectfully, I think fall short of the standard high principles that ought to be expected of a party or parties when it comes to the decision on the matters court, of constitutional the court, rights. The court, so not, the, 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 court should not, the court should not have granted the injunction. That's your point. No, I haven't... No, I haven't said that. I haven't said that. What I have said is my expectation was having then identified or having then shown um, consciousness of the peculiarities of the case. My expectation was the principles I expected, the application of the principles to have conformed to the peculiarities. Maybe the court should have seized the opportunity to have erected new principles in this place. If, but in terms if, of if, the substantive if, if their application of, or the result of it, if the application, as you say, had conformed to those standards, the injunction would not have been uh, granted. No, it simply meant that the party who argued before the court asking for the injunction perhaps would have been expected to show, um, to show certain proofs, which invariably may have been higher than the standard proof. Because do, do you, do you, do you, what, what do you say about this? What do you say about this? Um, and I, don't, I, I, I think that before we actually take a break, uh, my guest in the studio may also want to take a, a point on this. That the respondent, first respondent, we know that the Attorney General is like a nominal defendant in this matter. The respondent, that's the first re respondent, James Jachi Kwesin, did not file an affidavit as required to controvert the matters that were raised by the applicants in this uh, injunction application. It only re uh, stayed on its preliminary objection, which objection I'm, I'm sure all of us will agree the court was right in throwing the objection out. What do you say about that failure to file an affidavit to controvert the matters that, or counter the facts that had been raised by the applicant for injunction. Is that fatal or Where not? a party to a matter fails, to, it is partially fatal. And it's partially fatal because in normal cases, when a party fails to file processes to controvert certain facts, the court is allowed or enabled to accept those facts on the face of it. But it's prima facie, the court may still decide on its own to contradict them if the court has some evidence before it to contradict those facts. In the case of constitutional matters, it's even more. And the reason it's even more is because of the public interest dimensions of it. So the courts sometimes actually act as a vanguard against the breaches of the constitution. And so what parties actually file only facilitates the court in that direction. But when you say partially, could it have helped? to have had his affidavit in opposition. Because as you read the judgment, they are quoting the affidavit of the applicant. They don't quote because there is none for the, for the respondent, first respondent. I, I seem to have lost Abuchi there, um, unfortunate. But let me take your views on this briefly and then we proceed. Yes, uh, you start, yes. So something. Mm. 
Um, not filing an affidavit in opposition, I don't know the strategy that was adopted, but you know, affidavit essentially deposes to factual matters. And if the factual matters so deposed to are things that you disagree with, you're entitled by law to depose in disagreement. Mm. And you notice that from this case, the facts are so notorious. Mm. The fact of a judgment, the fact that honorable case still goes to parliament, these are matters that are not in secrecy. We all know about them. So I'm really wondering what would have been in an affidavit in opposition that we don't, we don't already know or that the court itself cannot even take judicial notice of, person to section 9 of the Evidence Act. So in my view, not filing in this case, and you notice that the court's, uh, the court's decision was premised entirely, and I repeat, on the high court judgment. And that is a fact. And in fact, by the rules of evidence, once it's even a public document, you don't even necessarily to, you have to depose to it under oath. Mm. So so long as that was there, I really didn't see what the, uh, um, the respondent was going to depose to in opposition to the affidavit as presented. And that, that is my view. So I don't think that the presence or otherwise of it was fatal to their case. You don't, you don't concede that even beyond this, that the, the, the representation for the judge equation was a bit, you know, do I say shoddy? Because at each point, you see that because of the importance of this case to them, things that they ought not be omitting, they are omitting. For example, when they, when they filed the appeal, what happened that they slept until it was late before, before they filed appeal? What happened that when they are supposed to file their written uh, submissions, they, they are found wanting, they don't file. And then you come to this court, to, you say, that we want the court to take judicial notice of notorious facts. Would you have done that? No, no, no that is not what I'm saying. But I don't Would you have done that? Would you have said it is not have, fatal, have, so have, have, I, I don't matter, you know, should There are instances where affidavits are served on me, and when I think that it doesn't affect my case in any way, I don't file affidavit in opposition. So there are sometimes I really want it that way. So it depends, like I said, it depends on the strategy you're adopting as a lawyer. And I don't think that the representation for the honorable question was shoddy or has been shoddy. What I think is that if you look at the Court of Appeal, and what I have, the documents I have cited indicates that whilst in the Court of Appeal, they had filed for stay of execution and then asked for a reference from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court on some matters that have been raised in the Notice of Appeal as constitutional. The Court of Appeal refused to do the reference and then they applied for certiorari in the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. which is due to be taken, I think, to the 6th of April. So on the strength of these processes that ha were pending before the Supreme Court, um, from what I have seen from the affidavit in support of the application for enlistment, they actually indicated that they had informed the court of the pendency of these applications. And because of these applications, which had the likelihood of affecting how the court... Would the rules are not suspended. The rules, Because yes, I, they are filed I, 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 other I, I, things. I agree, something that... The they, rules give the timeline, so you follow them. I agree, something that the rules are not suspended. When this, but I, from what I have said, and as I'm speaking to the document before... That's right. From what I have cited... There is a clear indication that the court was put in the known of the pendency and a time and asked, they asked for time before the application was struck out on a subsequent date. And they have actually deposed to that, I think, uh, if okay. I don't have, have the documents, that yeah. has actually been deposed to under oath. All so right. if the court or the respondent in that application thinks that those factual matters are not accurate, mm. they're entitled to depose to the actual... Let, let, me, let, me hear, let me hear quickly on this and... and, and I'm thinking, yes, it's okay to have all the discussion, but we can also look at this aspect where you can say counsel's conduct. So that Form 6 was, as we understand, was issued on the 13th of October, 2021. Now, the registrar of the court has the power to have kicked in a process that will strike out your appeal. The registrar didn't do that. And you sit until sometime in 2022 before you begin to act. And it's too late and your appeal is thrown out. We're talking about this one where you don't file an affidavit to oppose it. I'll, I'll make this point. You see, I, I keep making the point that litigation is war and war is tactical. So sometimes you may choose weapons 
and uh, your, your, the conduct of your warfare may be awry. In other words, may go so wrong, badly wrong. So it is very possible that the, 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 the team for the embattled MP chose the wrong weapons to use. But however, and whichever way one puts it, as far as the Supreme Court matter is concerned, and the fact that they did not file an affidavit in opposition, this much I can say. As a matter of law, you are entitled to rely on your opponent's processes and assume for the sake of legal argument that they are not contested. But raise legal issues to demonstrate that even if you hold all the facts and the evidence constant, as a matter of law, the person is not entitled to certain reliefs that the person is entitled to. In that respect, I would say that both on the substantive matter and in respect of the application for injunction, the argument of the education team will be the same. Mm. Because the, their, their contention is that mm. the rate itself is not, I mean, competent. Okay. And if the rate is not competent, indeed and in fact, if the Supreme Court had taken the view that the rate was incurable, incompetent, or they form a view that the rate before is so bad, then obviously it would have affected and influenced their view and determination of the interim application. Okay. So possibly that may be the reason why they could not have filed anything. But right. there's one comment I want to make because in, when in, you were calling in 30 seconds. Kabochi, yeah. mm. you are said something about this notoriety about uh, the fact that the distinction between nationality and citizenship and certificate of renunciation and so forth and so on. The argument is being made that once the Electoral Commission admitted questions documents, then thereafter, nobody could question it. And I think it's a very flawed and misconceived argument because whatever the Electoral Commission itself does is subject to law. Mm. And therefore, I, I do not know exactly what the Electoral Commission saw before they admitted the document of uh, the two to stand for election. But having okay. admitted it, mm. in no way the sentence the court for ruling mm. upon the admission of those documents. Right. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I hear Abuchi is still on the line. Hello? Yeah, Abuchi is, uh, yeah. Professor Abuchi is gone. Been. Yeah, he's still on the line. Um, we can get a minute or two of your take on this and then we go. Um, there, there are those who say, why? The court is, doesn't seem to be following precedent. Uh, we have what you call the Bilson versus Rawlings, where the court indicated that renunciation can be constructive or actual. Um, in the Zanato case, the court said that uh, qualification, the qualification clause kicks in upon nomination. And then in Ex parte Indum, they said, the Supreme Court said that um, the processes doesn't stop at the nomination. Um, it can go on for uh, a period. And, and so how does the, even the High Court come to this decision and for anybody to want to rely on it when the man had his uh, renunciation uh, purely communicated by November before the elections and he's swearing in. Okay, I'm not sure if you're leading me down the path of presentation because I think you mentioned that that being the substantive matter before the court, you don't want um, us to go into the expression of opinions on them, unless I'm mistaken yeah, on that. You're right. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, so, but I, if, I would, if I would take the opportunity just to also add to what I think um, uh, Kukwit has mentioned. Indeed, it is true, and it's important to clarify this, that there is no entity in Ghana, be it independent entity or otherwise, which is not subject to the constitutional supervisory jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court pronounces on everyone. In fact, some may even say it's unfair because the Supreme Court pronounces not only on everyone, but on itself. So where there are matters involving the court or the Supreme Court, it is the Supreme Court that has to pronounce on it. So the independence of the entity doesn't mean that it becomes a law unto itself so that its construction of the law is ultimately final. You were asking the question also earlier before my line became erratic as to whether the decision of the court is correct in this case. If you take the factual scenario of this case, i.e. being the fact that a high court has given a decision and then an applicant has come before the court for an interpretation and it's seeking that pending the decision of that matter, the decision of the High Court should be respected. I think it makes the Supreme Court's decision in this case um, correct 
The only way the Supreme Court decision could have been problematic is if there had been a stay of execution successfully brought against the High Court decision. Then, of course, you cannot go the back door by coming to the Supreme Court and now using the process of injunction to stop a party who had himself also stopped an earlier judgment given against him mm-hmm. from proceeding to enjoy his right. So it appears that in the absence of a stay, the High Court decision is active. And if the High Court decision is active, I would have wished that he had gone through the normal enforcement processes to ensure that the, the orders are respected. But having come before the Supreme Court, and as you've rightly corrected, there was already a substantive matter before the Supreme Court before he brought the application for injunction. It does seem that the Supreme Court decision would have been properly predicated. All right. Thank you so very much, Professor Kofi Abochi, uh, Dean of the UPSA Law School, uh, Law Faculty, um, I guess, in the studio have been Kweku uh, Yamua Pencil. He's lawyer and managing solicitor, Pencil, Pencil and Co. Rend of Chumisi Ankara is also lawyer with the firm Morrison Chumisi and Partners. And we will take a break here. When we return, Professor Lord Mensa, Associate Professor, University of Ghana Business School, uh, Mr. Seth Tekpe, former Minister for Finance, Executive Director, PMF, Tax Africa Network, and part-time lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, um, will join my two other guests, Prof. Abuchi and Kweku Pencil, to talk about the uh, state-owned enterprises that have been very wasteful and only incurring loss. What should happen to them? We'll be right back.